my name is Pierre Villemot. I'm coming from uh, Dimension Studio in London. So we're a real-time production company, which means we work on movies, TV shows, advertising. We've been doing a bit of uh, metaverse as well. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, computer graphics, like 3D assets, specifically how we create them, and uh, more specifically how the new kind of uh, AI technology is uh, changing the, the usual pipeline. So first, a, a bit of background. So historically, 3D assets have been made out of polygons, usually triangles, because they're kind of the simplest polygon to deal with. So yeah, I guess most of you in the room are old, old enough that you remember the PlayStation 1, where back in the day, the triangle making up the character were fairly obvious. You can see them. You can count the number of triangles in there. Uh, so that other image on the, on the right, that's what is considered to be the very first uh, computer-generated 3D asset. So the, the story that goes with it is quite interesting. Uh, that was made by uh, Ed Catmull, who then co-founded Pixar and eventually became uh, director of Disney Animation. So the way this was made is that uh, the guy cast his hand in plaster, so that he ended up with a life-size replica of his hand sitting on his desk. He drew all of the lines that we can see on the plaster, and then went on to measure the XYZ coordinate of every intersection of the line he drew, and inputted that into the computer in order to create the, the data that represents the 3D model. And then from there, what you do is that you, you project your 3D point onto a t 2D image plane in order to create an image. So that's kind of like high school level uh, math, but I'm not going to go too deep into it because I would probably get it wrong anyway. And uh, the reason this is blurry is that this dates from like before we could actually save an image using a computer. Like we're, we're talking really old computer. So this is actually a, a film photography of one of these uh, old school uh, CRT computer monitor. And it's a bit blurry. So yeah, like historically polygon, uh, nowadays still polygon, just a lot more of them. So the, the screenshot is like part of the, um, not sure, promotional material or some kind of technical talk from uh, Unreal Engine. So they, they rolled out this uh, nanite kind of renderer a couple of years ago. It's, it's the same. It's still triangles. It's still uh, projecting them onto the plane. It's just that now we are talking about something like millions of, uh, millions of triangles for every single uh, frame you see in a video game or in a movie. So this one is not quite uh, just projecting the point. When you do that, it's called rasterization. This is ray tracing. So instead of uh, taking your point and computing where it intersects your plane, what you do is that you take your uh, virtual camera in your virtual world, so just talking about like 3D, 3D coordinate on uh, camera matrices. And for uh, each pixel of the image you want to create, you compute the, the ray between what we call the, the camera focal point, the, the point when you take a picture where all of the light of ray converge, and the pixel in your image plane. And what you do is that you propagate this ray through your virtual world until you intersect, until you collide with a triangle. And once you figure out which is the first triangle you collide with, you can uh, query the color that the, the artist assigned to the triangle, and that will become the, the color of your pixel. So that's, uh, that's what we call ray tracing. And uh, yeah, it makes up quite a bit of video game on movie work nowadays. Uh, the reason we're talking about 3D asset as a um, kind of VFX company that works in movie is that nowadays movies are made in 3D. That's why every kind of recent movie you've seen in the last four or five years has this kind of video game feeling if you, if you pay attention to it. The, the light is just a, a bit too, too uniform to be real. And uh, so this is uh, the evolution. Like Everyone is familiar with the concept of the green screen, where you would shoot your, uh, your actors in front of a green screen and then transport them onto a different background. 
Uh, we don't really do that anymore. Now what we do is that we scan an actor in 3D. So instead of having just a picture, you get like a full 3D representation of what your actor looks like and what motion they are uh, performing on stage. And then we insert that in a game engine. And the, the benefit of that is that you can figure out your camera angles after the fact. So movie directors, from what I've been told, tend to be a bit uh, picky and change their mind every now and then. And uh, when you change your mind about uh, a camera angle doing a green screen, you need to go back to the studio, shoot with a different camera, and redo the process. Whereas once you have a 3D asset, it's just like, OK, we're just going to turn the camera, the virtual camera a couple of degrees, and we're, we're good to go. So yeah, everything in a, nah, not, not everything, but a, a lot in movie nowadays is done with 3D assets. Um, so in terms of the, the new technologies uh, where AI comes into play, I think the biggest breakthrough we had in the last couple of years was NERFs. So that stands for a uh, neural radiance field. So it's a, it's a volumetric rendering and an inverse rendering uh, system. So volumetric rendering is uh, the general case from ray tracing. So remember when I explained ray tracing a minute ago, I said you define the trajectory of your ray, and the first triangle you intersect is going to provide the color. In volumetric rendering, every point in space that your uh, ray traverses is going to provide some form of color. So the, the best way for me to explain that is to imagine you have a, you have a camera, you have some kind of colored glass, and you have your record. And the, the rays that are going to go from your camera is going to traverse the air between the camera and the glass. And that's fully transparent. It's not going to do anything. Then you're going to go through your glass, which is probably, let's say, it's slightly green tint. It's going to go through the glass, and it's going to pick up a bit of green, because that's what it's going to look like if you look at someone's green glass, is that everything is going to be tinted in green. But you don't stop there. You just keep going because the glass is transparent. And eventually, your ray is going to intersect with the person, which people are opaque, so it's going to fully absorb the ray. And like, let's say the, the ray is going to in intersect with my sweater. It's going to pick up a bit of blue. So the, the resulting pixel you're going to get for your uh, computer-generated image is going to be like a, a mix of blue and green, because you're mixing both, uh, you're mixing both colors. And so the, the advantage of doing this thing is, obviously, you can render transparent material, like uh, glass or fog, smoke. Uh, it's useful in, uh, in humans as well, because air kind of lets some, uh, some light shine through. Uh, the ears as well, if you shine a strong light behind someone's ear, you kind of see through as well. And uh, having this kind of idea of uh, varying opacity is giving you better looking image. And the second, uh, second point is inverse rendering. So when we talked about the end, we collected the data, put it in the computer, and from the data, we create an image. Inverse rendering is the opposite direction. We have the image, and what we're trying to do is, from the image, trying to infer the geometry of the scene. So the way that works is that you need multiple views of the same person, object, subject, whatever it is you, you want to scan. So this is what the, the studio looks like. Uh, you have, currently, we have eight camera towers. So each of these kind of uh, ladder thing has between uh, six and eight cameras, which at the end of the day gives you something in the area of like 70, 75 cameras, counting the overhead one. And what you get is just basically the, the same person photographed from a, a lot of different angles. And then it's, a, um, it's an optimization problem. It's, uh, we, we're doing like gradient descent based uh, optimization and kind of presenting it at an AI conference because it's the same building block. And uh, what you do is that you have a fully differentiable pipeline that represents, OK, given a, a given 3D geometry, what will be the image out? And you can compare against the ground truth image that you get to optimize the representation. So the way representation works in NERF is that you have uh, two neural networks. The first one is predicting, uh, is taking as an input the x, y, z coordinate of every point in space. So for each, remember, the, the ray traveling through space 
for each uh, you're going to sample along, and for each point you're sample, you're going to compute the XYZ coordinate and feed it to a neural network. And the neural network job is to predict, OK, is there something in there? Is there nothing? Is there something transparent? So you're going to get a density value. So typically, air is going to predict 0. The glass is going to predict like 0.2. And when you finally reach uh, something solid, it's going to predict one. And that gives you your, uh, your density. And the second network is uh, in charge of predicting the color. So the second network also gets the XYZ coordinate in order to be able to predict the, the color at a given point. But it also takes uh, an encoding of the view direction, aka from which direction are you looking at the object. And this is what uh, gives you the ability to have what we call view-dependent effects, so specular lighting and uh, this kind of thing. So typically, the fact that the dress is sparkling is because when you turn the camera around, you're going to get a different uh, light reflection. And that's what the, the second network is predicting, thanks to having the view direction as an input. So yeah, that's, that's Nerf. And the second, uh, the second big method that has been uh, very popular over the last year, year and a half, is uh, Gaussian splitting. So Gaussian splitting is also volumetric rendering and inverse rendering, but it's kind of like the, the discrete version of NERF. Instead of trying to predict uh, a density and color for each point of space using neural network, you have these discrete entities, so they're called Gaussian splat. They're kind of like egg-shaped uh, Polygons, they're like the, the evolution of the triangle we were talking at the beginning. And uh, what you do is that same through inverse rendering, you're able to optimize uh, the position, color, and scale of these uh, little eggs that float in space. And you're able to reconstruct the, the scene as a, a point cloud, like a, yeah, a, a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian splat cloud. And um, what, we are what I specifically put on the, on the slide is an image from a paper called Gaussian Avatar. And so what we're looking at is that the, the guy in the blue shirt at some point stepped into the, the studio that was on the previous slide. They asked him to do a range of uh, facial expression, like open your mouth, open your eyes, blink, and everything. And then what they do is that they, they fit a, a parametric mesh so like a regular polygon mesh that has the right, uh, right expression. And they glue a bunch of Gaussian to the surface of the mesh so that they can uh, optimize uh, the color and opacity of those. And because the mesh is something that is well-defined and you can, uh, you can control, uh, this guy with the beard is actually able to uh, control the avatar like a, like a puppet. And uh, this has been one of the reasons we had like an actor strike at, at the beginning of the year. Because basically, once that guy in the blue t-shirt went in the studio and got his, uh, his likeness captured, we don't really need him anymore. It's like we can animate him. And actors are not happy because obviously that kind of puts them out of a job. If you can just uh, reanimate them and have their image uh, without having them acting. And uh, the second reason is that uh, you might end up seeing yourself on the screen saying stuff you would never agree to say in real life. So there is a bit of uh, an ethical uh, dilemma in there as well. But uh, yeah, hopefully we are moving towards uh, some kind of rules that makes it work for everyone. Um, so the, the reason we're talking about um, 3D content creation and why it's important for me is that uh, if you remember the very beginning of the internet, that was all text, like that. Then once we got phone in our pocket with cameras and we got broadband on a, a bit more bandwidth, we started having a lot of image. So the golden age of uh, Instagram and visual, uh, visual culture and everything. Lately, it's been all about video. So I guess people spend most of their, uh, most of their online time watching TikToks on uh, shorts and whatever, like every platform has their kind of story implemented. And uh, with the uh, with virtual, uh, virtual reality headset coming to the market, my, uh, my prediction is that we are going to start to consume a lot of 3D content because it's just going to be like uh, overlaid on top of the, of the real world with uh, augmented reality. 
And I expect that the, the demand for 3D content is going to grow exponentially. And the, the value of having these tools that are able to produce it a lot faster and with a, a really decent level of quality. So, yeah, that's my last slide. I think I've been rushing through. So we have time for a question. No question? What do you mean beyond the Gaussian thing? Uh, so we're working on the, the idea of uh, animating it over time. So the, the problem is that it's a bit of a difficult optimization process because for each frame of video, you're going to end up with a different set of Gaussian. Because if you, uh, if you have things that appear alongside the video, like for example, if you were to record the, the talk in 3D and I was to take off my jumper, you would have no Gaussian with white to model the shirt that's going to appear. So it's a bit of a difficult problem because you, you would need to know in advance what's coming further and make sure all of the, the Gaussian you need in order to model that is present. And uh, currently, it is going to happen. It's just there is a lot of engineering to put in, and uh, no one did it yet. Uh, yeah, so the, I guess uh, the next big challenge is to have it in, uh, in four-dimensional, so 3D plus time, so that we can have a moving representation, which is what I've been working on. So I, I got it working on Nerf for like fairly small sequences. And uh, Gaussian, yeah, is, is a bit of a problem because of this idea that you might have stuff that appears over time, and you cannot just make it pop out of, a, like, create the data just like that without, um, I mean, I'm saying you can't, you, you can, obviously. The problem is that it creates flickering artifacts, and it looks nasty. Like, people would never put it in advertising, yes? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So inverse rendering is uh, you, you do not work given the geometry. The geometry is what you're trying to optimize. And so the idea is that you, your whole pipeline is fully differentiable. So you have two different things. You have the inverse rendering for uh, NERF, where what you're trying to do is to train the network to predict the correct density for each point in space. So your, your geometry is encoded as a, a field of density. And you have the Gaussian one, where your, your uh, geometry is encoded as uh, the density of the Gaussian, which are discrete uh, particles floating in space. And uh, yeah, the way you optimize it is like, it's called the, the volumetric rendering equation. And uh, it's something like the, the color of your final pixel is going to be dependent of the density you sample and the distance between the current point and the next point you're going to be sampling. And yeah, this is basically all addition and multiplication. So you just run your back propagation through it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of people do it from like a video shot on a smartphone. The, the thing is that as long as you're dealing with a, a static subject, it's fine because you can move around and your subject did not change by the time you, you walked around it. Uh, what we're doing in cinema is that we, we want to have like people acting. And uh, if, I film, if I film you from, uh, from the front while you're doing a performance, by the time I uh, film you from the back, I cannot predict what your face looks like from the front. So we need a, we need, we need a lot of camera. Uh, ideally, we want to have the camera gen locked, which is uh, you, want to, you want them to have the shutter opening and closing uh, synchronously, even though it, it doesn't really matter for, uh, for Nerf because it's, uh, everything is continuous, so technically you could do it. But because we're running classic photogrammetry pipeline in parallel, it means that we need a studio that is uh, able to gen lock the camera. But yeah, the, 
the barrier to entry is probably gonna go down over time. Okay, thank you.